Hi, good evening. Welcome to San Francisco Public Library. I'm Susan Goldstein. I'm the city archivist, and I manage the San Francisco History Center up on the sixth floor of the library. And if you haven't noticed, it's the 75th anniversary of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and so the library has been hosting a series of events in honor of this. And we're winding down this month, and I just want to talk about a couple of events still to come. Um, if you haven't seen him yet, Jim Van Buskirk is still doing his show on location, the Golden Gate Bridge on the silver screen, and it's a wonderful collection of film clips of the bridge. And he was interviewed on Michael Krasny this morning. It was a very interesting interview. And it's going to be at Ortega Branch this Saturday, and then the Excelsior Branch for the final two of those. And there's flyers in the back. Also upstairs on the sixth floor of the main library, we have an exhibit, Bridging Minds, San Francisco Reads, 1933 through 1937. And it's a wonderful exhibit about book culture in San Francisco during the Depression. So I encourage you to go up to the sixth floor and take a look. Turning to tonight's program, Kevin Starr's book, Golden Gate, The Life and Times of America's Greatest Bridge, is featured as our on the same page pick for May and June. And I know a lot of you are reading it because there's about 300 copies checked out of the library system right now. But there's still some available if you haven't read it yet. And also, I want to thank Reader's Books. They're going to be handling the book sales after tonight's program. And I know some of you have already bought books from them. Um, and introducing Kevin, Kevin Starr is University Professor of History at University of Southern California. He was city librarian here in San Francisco from 1973 to 1976, and state librarian of California from 1994 to 2004. Dr. Starr is a prolific writer of articles and books. We have many of them in the library. His seven-volume history, Americans and the California Dream, has earned him the National Medal for the Humanities, among many other honors. And he was a 2010 inductee into the California Hall of Fame. Um, Kevin Starr is also one of our gracious researchers up in the San Francisco History Center from time to time, and he is definitely the only one who croons Johnny Mathis songs to the staff. And I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. Kevin Starr, our speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. What a, a pleasure to be here in this um, beautiful library, which uh, I can remember when it was uh, being debated over in 1973 when I was a city librarian, uh, and um, it's done such a, uh, achieved such a wonderful uh, building and development of the site and this great auditorium. And to think that without any conflict of interest on my part, I said nothing to anyone that they Bought, that the library bought 300 copies. I mean, that's a writer's dream, my goodness. <laughs> 300 copies. I, 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 uh, uh, that, has to, that goes down as the sale of my life, really, so thank you. <laughs> and of course, you, you, just, uh, you are, a, a writer is interested in, in, in sales. Uh, I, I have a, a day job teaching at, at uh, USC, and so it's not as if I have to, the sales to pay my rent, uh, uh, et cetera. But your publisher puts so much time into a book and so much money. I mean, a publisher will put a couple hundred thousand dollars in the development of a book and, um, and, and with your advance, et cetera. And you want to at least earn all that back for the publisher. Otherwise, they tend not to answer your agent's telephone calls when next, uh, when next you call. But this book was uh, fun for me to write. Um, it's about only a, a something like 40,000 words, <clears throat> and it's different from my normal book because it usually takes me <clears throat> about 40,000 words just to clear my throat at the beginning of a book. My <laughs> prefaces have run that long. But, and it's, and it's, it, it, the book is in no way intended to replace, it's a supplement to uh, John Vanderzee's magnificent 1985 comprehensive history, uh, uh, which is a very big, long, a wonderful book that came out in, in 1985, and and or even and, and which is in there, our San Francisco History Room, that marvelous three-volume uh, issued by the Golden uh, Gate uh, Bridge and District in 1937-38, when the when the bridge was completed, that three-volume uh, description, official description of the bridge, which I'm sure we have here. In fact, I probably consulted it here, and uh, it is uh, it's a comprehensive. The literature of the bridge is, is uh, it, it very uh, involved. There have been any number of uh, 
attempts to look at it uh, over the years. And what my uh, publisher asked me to do, Bloomsbury, which I, I'm not a, mayor client, a major client of theirs because uh, they do the Harry Potter series. So you see they have other uh, writers involved. But they, they said they wanted a sense, a book that would deal with the bridge aesthetically, culturally, as a work of art, as well as a work of engineering. What does the bridge mean? Well, the bridge, the problem with the Golden Gate Bridge, a bridge means a bridge. And the Golden Gate Bridge does not really need interpretation uh, from any of us. It, we, it, it, uh, it speaks for itself. And it speaks in a very powerful, immediate, uh, nonverbal way to us, which is possibly why the, I think the highest art form in response to the bridge has been uh, photography. The photo photographers have captured the bridge uh, the, the best, I think. Uh, because of the visual, letting the bridge speak through, through itself visually. If you look at the uh, the counterpart back in the past, the uh, the uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, another one of these iconic structures through which we Americans can uh, define ourselves, define our space, define our relationship to our own lives as well as the culture and society around us. The Brooklyn Bridge certainly has to be one of those. And which, incidentally, the Brooklyn Bridge opened in the 1880s with an equally festive pedestrian uh, promenade across, uh, down through the bridge. But the Brooklyn Bridge has inspired any number of artistic responses. So over the years, think of the three volumes, uh, three uh, paintings by Joseph Stella done just before World War II, uh, correction, World War I on the bridge. And of course, most dramatically, Hart Crane's The Bridge, the poem of 1930 in which Hart Crane sees the Brooklyn Bridge as almost a, a, an Aeolian harp, to use Coleridge's phrase, of a, through which the entire American history and experience plays as if, uh, as if we would strike the, uh, the strings of a lyre when, you, uh, when, the, when that history moves through the suspensions of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, the Golden Gate Bridge has inspired comparable awe, but not yet the great literary masterpiece, although uh, a number of years ago, uh, uh, Veth, Seth at, uh, at uh, Stanford University Economist did a beautiful novel in sonnet form called The Gold Golden Gate, in which people live beneath the, uh, the various San Franciscans uh, have at certain po moments of their life the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, encounter with the bridge. And uh, the, uh, there's been music, uh, 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 especially with the 75th anniversary, there's a musical composition that debuted with the Marin Symphony Orchestra. And the photography of the bridge continues, but still, I think, out in front of it all as a work of art is the bridge itself. And, and this is in no way to denigrate any attempts to interpret it to include my own. Um, and of course, this marvelous use in advertising. I think I just love... I just still keep asking myself, why is that lady sleeping on a certain mattress at the entrance to the Golden Gate Bridge in Mancini's sleep world? I mean, there she is, and she's not being bothered by the traffic or anything, but that bridge shows up promoting so many different kinds of, of, uh, of products because it is a, a very powerful, powerful icon. Well, the, uh, and it, it, as such, it participates in the bridge itself uh, as a genre, a human genre, a genre of human creation, civil engineering. Uh, you, you think of, for instance, in ancient Rome, uh, the highest religious office was the Pontifex Maximus, the great uh, head of the bridge, the great chief of the bridge. Julius Caesar had held that uh, position for a number of years. Um, and, and of course, the Roman, in the Roman Catholic Church, the, uh, the uh, Bishop of Rome was called the Pontiff, the bridge. You think of bridges across uh, the planet, the, the power of bridges, the bridges, of, bridge of size, the bridge uh, across the Arno, the, Pont, uh, the great uh, uh, Ponte Vecchio, uh, the bridge, beautiful bridges of Paris, or the Covington Bridge here in the United St <coughs> States, as well as the Brooklyn Bridge. There's something fundamental about a bridge. It's, it's an archetype uh, itself. It's a natural statement about going from one place to another. Hence, it's uh, used by poets and and, uh, and novelists and painters, et cetera, to suggest various types of developments and transformations. So that, I think all of that is in the power of, of uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. It's a, a triumph of, uh, the bridge also bespeaks civilization. We, are, we Californians love wilderness. We love uh, preserved wilderness, but we also love um, 
civilization and what uh, men and women make uh, as long as the stewardship is proper regarding nature. George Santayana, one of my favorite writers, a professor at Harvard in the late 19th, early 20th century, a man who somehow managed to fuse materialism and Platonism as a, in, in philosophical terms, uh, says about California that in, when he talked to the Berkeley Philosophical Union in 1910, his famous essay on the genteel tradition, in effect saying, uh, you Californians live in one of the most engineered places on the planet, and yet nature is your primary symbol. You're always kind of, you're always taken between those two polarities. And of course, the Golden Gate Bridge does that beautifully, doesn't it? Linking uh, the highest form, perhaps, of human creation, the total city, the city in time, city in history, in our case, San Francisco, uh, and, the, and behind that, the entire Bay Area with the wild uh, Marin uh, headlands. And it's a beautiful uh, statement, iconic statement, about San Francisco uh, as a product of, of, uh, of human history and nature as a product of the uh, geological evolution uh, of the planet. And Santayana caught, caught that, picked that up uh, beautifully. Well, if you look at, at one of my books I did a number of years ago, I talked about the necessity of completing California through public works. So much of California in which we live, in fact, over 70% of us live in the footprint established by Spain and Mexico, which is to say about 70% of us live from San Diego up to about Petaluma, from 70, mile, 70 miles from, and in from the shore. So I think that's very interesting that, uh, that as long as we've been here, uh, I'm talking about European and American Europe, uh, Californians, but even even Native American or Californians did not penetrate the Central Valley to any great degree. Uh, you have to really go over to the Sierra Nevada before you find them. And even then, the numbers are not as extensive as they were the Native Americans on the coast. So there's something uh, about uh, completing California when uh, in the beginnings of the American period, the great, <clears throat> the great city was supposed to be what we now call Benicia. It was then called uh, by the planners, uh, Thomas Oliver Larkin, our first consul general of California, and General Vallejo, who he named it after his wife, Benicia Vallejo. It was called, at that point, uh, New York of the Pacific, because we knew that a railroad would cross the country. We knew that. In 1855, Dr. Oliver Rosencrux, right here at the Mechanics Institute in San Francisco, gave a, a, the earliest talk I can come up with encouraging the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. And if that Transcontinental Railroad came uh, across the country, it could not, of course, get to the city itself, which grew up in this improbable peninsula jutting out into the, in certain parts of the western part of it, especially jutting out into the fog bank when the rest of California is sitting under, 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 under uh, sunshine. So we, we linked up to San Jose. By 1860, we have train service to San Jose. Uh, that, that train named the California, and that locomotive was built completely here at, by the Union Iron Works, by the Donahue Brothers, itself a triumph of technology. Uh, and we began work on the railroad in, uh, in uh, 1864, 65, and uh, we knew it was coming. So the idea of the railroad, uh, the idea of somehow linking up the, the city uh, became a necessity in the California imagination. We have to remember that until 1909, some 60% of the people in this state lived either in San Francisco or around the Bay Area, the rim of the Bay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and, and of course, today, some 60% of Californians wish they live in the San Francisco Bay Area. But you have this extraordinary concentration of population. <laughs> with Los Angeles, for instance, 11, 12,000, maybe 15,000 into the until the 1880s when the railroad connected with Los Angeles in the mid-1880s, the Atchison, Topeka, and S Santa Fe coming across. I love to say that all the time. I say it one more time. I just love to say it because I can just hear Judy Garland singing it, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe from, I think it was Harvey Girls was the musical. Girls. Harvey Girl, Harvey Girl, way, way back. Um, so the, the railroad was on the mind, and the, uh, as far as I can tell, the, uh, it was shown. It was shown in one of the scene in one of the uh, a bridge going across where the Oakland Bay Bridge is now, linking Oakland and San Francisco. 
was shown in uh, on a on a curtain in one of the San Francisco theaters by the mid 18 in the mid 1850s as an illustration. But the first person to call for it, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, was of course uh, Emperor Norton. And um, to this day, I don't know whether Andrew Norton really was a madman or delusional or whether he was very smart and found a way to get through life with all his bills paid, etc., following, fa following his financial co uh, collapse when he cornered the rice market in um, San Francisco and then later went broke. But anyway, he called for the bridge, wanted it to go across, but he wanted it, once it got uh, over to the Marin side, he wanted to continue out until the fair lines. Uh, so we... That plan was was just left there, but it was nevertheless there. I myself am fascinated uh, by the fact that um, Carrillo uh, uh, sailed past the Golden Gate in 15, well, he was passed away. He, he didn't make it up that far, but his crew did that expedition in, uh, in 1540. And all those uh, Spanish galleons that began to come from Manila to the California coast, after 1565, one per year would hit hit the uh, Pacific coast somewhere around uh, Del Norte or Mendocino County, maybe even further up in Oregon, then come down the coast and go around in the Gulf uh, uh, to Mexico, uh, to Baja California, to Mexico. Not one of them saw the uh, the, the the bridge. I mean, the the opening, the strait, and uh, Viscano. Uh, uh, in 1604, the great expedition sailed past the the the, uh, the strait itself, and he reported that the most important port on the Pacific coast uh, was Monterey, which is one of the reasons it was chosen by the Spanish as the capital. Uh, uh, in in 1769, uh, uh, so the fact that this strait, just this grand strait leading into this heroic bay remained out of uh, uh, Euro-American consciousness is to me a very fascinating point. I have to be very careful with my language because uh, it was Euro-American consciousness. Obviously, the Native American cultures, the Miwok, the Ohlone, uh, had built for thousands and thousands of years a successful cultures, a variety of successful cultures around the Bay. Uh, uh, as we know, in part from Malcolm Margolin's wonderful book, The Ohlone Way. Well, when Fremont uh, wrote the General Charles, not General then, Captain uh, uh, John Charles Fremont to, uh, saw the strait. Uh, he was the second major reporting. The first major report was the Portola expedition, which from the vantage point of Pacifica came up in 1769, looked down and saw the bay, sent Sergeant Ortega and eight men around in October 1769 to do a reconnaissance of the bay. They came back and reported on this astonishing body of water. And uh, the, uh, the, the interest grew uh, on the part of, Sp uh, of uh, Spain. And uh, six years later, Lieutenant Ayala uh, 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 um, sails his, boat, his ship into, into San Francisco. But when Fremont described this strait, uh, the gold that he was describing was not the gold of the gold rush, not the mineral gold. It was the gold of the golden horn. Uh, it's, my wife and I had the privilege of going to Istanbul. I have to, can't say Constantinople, but then again, there's another song, Istanbul is Constantinople, the, the four freshmen. My, my mind is like a jukebox going on all the time. Uh, the... Uh, the uh, leading where you come in to the, the harbor and then there's a long straightway coming in and then you open it up and there's, there's Istanbul surrounding the, 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 the great harbor and then there's even an inner harbor sort of comparable to San Pablo Bay here in, uh, in, in our own San Francisco Bay. And Fremont, uh, as he describes it in his report of 1846, which was ghost -ridden, written in part by his wife, Jessie Benton, uh, he says his, he named it Chrysopolis, the Golden Gate, in honor of that great city uh, that would someday, that great urban uh, con construct that would someday rise up on the shores of this bay, like uh, as in the case of Constantinople. So I think that's, that's important to remember that gold, especially when we come back and link it up with international orange. So there's, there's a, a, a tremendous uh, push then by railroad people. Later, when the automobile comes by Marin County, but I'll, we'll get to that in a second. That's why Charles Crocker's, uh, of the, of the, one of the big four, his proposal for a uh, trestle bridge 
is is important because of uh, uh, of uh, the, getting the railroad across. Uh, but that was, of course, impossible. But he suggested something like the um, the San Mateo or Dumbarton Bridge uh, uh, of, of today. Um, by the time we get to um, the Panama Pacific International Exposition of 1915, uh, we have really the begin the automobile. 1911, California p passes its first um, Highway Construction Act, and you have that beautiful sequence. Those of you who know Burlingame, downtown Burlingame, you have this wonderful sequence where the John uh, McLaren, probably those eucalyptus are still there running the downtown. It's a beautiful area. That was the first bit of property, of uh, roadway to be constructed under that, under that act. And there it is today, just as beautiful as ever, beginning of thousands and thousands of miles. And you have the, the what uh, can easily be described as the automobilization, as well as the train, the problem with the train uh, district uh, uh, for, for, the, for the city. Now, the population of this city at the epicenter of 60,000 also encouraged an extraordinary ferry culture. Some 50, during a work week, some 50,000 transits a day, some 25 coming in or more coming back uh, all throughout the Bay Area. In fact, the ferry building, which still stands, 1896, 94, 95, 96, which dates differ depending on what time you think it, it, it was really put into operation. Uh, Charles, Big, Charles Brown and, and uh, John and Edward Swain's magnificent tower there, modeled on the Geralda Tower of Seville. That uh, that uh, uh, ferry culture yielded uh, uh, the uh, busiest terminal in the English-speaking world outside of Charing Cross, London. So you had the very successful uh, commute culture rise up with the ferry company, which incidentally, the Golden Gate Ferry Company was owned by the uh, owned by the uh, Southern Pacific. And from there, uh, then you have, so you have a developed culture except the automobile uh, is, to, is uh, demanding a recognition and also the northern, um, the northern coast, the north coast. A little bit earlier, 1910, uh, Jack London uh, went with a trap. I'm, I'm not a horse, I'm not a person, but apparently a trap is a very light uh, one horse uh, uh, vehicle, and he went that, although the freight and everything, the camping equipment was taken in a heavier uh, wagon, touring Northern California, the co Northern Coast, and he, in effect, uh, did this just about the same time that Henry James was uh, visiting his uh, his daughter-in-law, his not daughter-in-law, his niece uh, here in uh, uh, San Francisco, and then he went down to Southern California and described Southern California as an Italy awaiting its history. And he described Northern California, north of the Bay, the, what we call today the Redwood Empire, as a Switzerland away, awaiting its history. Jack London. So I don't want to put Jack London and Henry James in the same room. I don't know they get along that well. But <laughs> never, nevertheless, they each were making those kinds of predictions. Well, for that to occur, there had to be connection between the hinterland of the North Coast and San Francisco for the North Bay. And that's why I'm thrilled that even though they've renamed that grand entrance, so they've named that grand entrance to the bay to the bridge now, uh, the Presidio Parkway, I think I've got that correct, I think that, l that last part on the other side of the tunnel should stay the Doyle Drive because Frank Doyle of Santa Rosa is, is, is a very powerful person in our story. Uh, for the Panama Pacific Exposition, uh, it was building upon the Burnham Plan of 1905, of which we have, uh, I think, two or three original copies here in our, in our archives. Uh, Daniel Hudson Burnham, who laid out to Chicago, the Chicago Fair of 93, laid out Manila, St. Louis, who worked on the updating of Enfant's plan for Washington, uh, did a plan for San Francisco in 1985 in which he saw, in which he envisioned great pedestrian promenades as uh, uh, moving through the city. And I think the idea of the, I'll come back to this idea when I talk about the pedestrian nature of the bridge, why it's not just an accident that 10 million people a, a year walk across that bridge. So all these things are converging. Uh, the desire of the North Coast, the automobile culture. If you took a vacation, the development of Marin County as a vacation and Sonoma, if you took a vacation on a, and you took an automobile, uh, by the um, late teens or early 1920s, you came back, you had to get on the ferry at Sausalito, and there's one recorded time where you faced a four-hour wait. 
Now, that's, that's the big record that I could come up with, but that certainly would ruin the end of your weekend, wouldn't it, to be sitting there for four hours waiting to come back and, and all build to San Francisco. Um, 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 the, um, Michael O'Shaughnessy, the great city engineer of California, of San Francisco, uh, went, uh, used to go take this ferry across to uh, Marin County to hike, etc. on the weekends. He met Joseph Strauss in the Panama Pacific Exposition of 1915. Strauss was a great business uh, bri bridge builder. He had uh, gone to the Cincinnati, University of Cincinnati, where he'd taken his um, civil engineering degree. And his senior thesis was on bridging the, the um, Alaska and Siberia across the Bering Strait uh, with a bridge. Incidentally, another great Bay Area bridge man, T.Y. Lin, who's now passed on, also has a remarkable uh, suggestion on how that could be uh, bridged, and perhaps someday that will happen. You take the Alaska, Alaska Highway right into, uh, into uh, Siberia, but we'll see how that turns out in time, or some of you will see that. Um, he, um, he did a, a bath. A, 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 he was an, an expert in the bascule, living, lifting bridges, etc., by weights. And he did a, a scope uh, where you could get in, put about 15, 20, 30 people in, lift them up about 200 feet, and take them around to see the Panama Fair from a, a height. He and he and uh, uh, Shaughnessy began to talk about a bridge across the the the, uh, the Golden Gate Strait. And they did a plan for it. The plan was released in a pamphlet in 1921, a pamphlet which we have also here. I say we, it's like I'm still here on the staff. Uh, I'm so fond of this library. We, uh, the pamphlet which we have, and the bridge was proposed as a memorial to the dead of World War I. But it was, a, it was not a suspension structure. It was two cantilevered structures straining out from the land and then a suspension bridge in the middle. So it was a hybrid form. Uh, one critic said of it that it looked like an inverted or upside down rat trap. And um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 nevertheless, the plan took, 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 uh, took flight. Thanks to Frank Doyle, a Santa Rosa insurance man, banker, water department executive, who knew that the North Coast had to have automobile connections. And thanks in part also to Marin County. A uh, man named Frank Linfield, especially a reporter, but the Marin County knew that its, its destiny uh, was, which was already dairying and agriculture, you can still see that so magnificently preserved in West Marin. Marin knew that it uh, wanted to have uh, some kind of uh, continuing uh, urban slash suburban development uh, uh, further on its uh, e eastern and southern edge. The, this uh, convention was extra extraordinary. It uh, was attended by over 200 people, to include O'Shaughnessy, to include Mayor Rolfe of San Francisco, all the counties around the Bay, and Del Norte County. Uh, Del Norte County wanted to tourism, felt they could get tourism up to there. It's on the bo Oregon border, and uh, it succeeded in uh, getting uh, uh, joining that. They formed the bridging, they, the, it's called the Golden Gate, Bridging the Gate District, ING was on it, and uh, the Congress, the Assemblyman from Napa puts it through, and it's approved by the uh, Assembly two, uh, two years after this convention. And it's based on irrigation, the irrigation districts. In Lux ver versus Hagen, Lux versus Hagen, we uh, solved, not solved our water problems in California, but we came up with a formula for how to, how to, uh, how to, um, uh, distribute uh, water downstream. In the Wright Act in the mid-1880s, we authorized the farmers of California to form quasi-governmental districts and issue bonds, raise funds, and build uh, construction uh, uh, irrigation works. And so using that as a model, this brand new entity, Dick Bridge District, was formed. Now today we're used to, especially throughout California, not so much in San Francisco where we kept things under city government, but if you lived in Southern California, you'd have a bridge district and a garbage district and a school district and a, a seashore district. A variety of districts would be overlapping whatever uh, political constituency or whatever township or city you were in, especially in, in uh, outside of Los Angeles. This, uh, this district <clears throat> is approved um, uh, by the elected officials 
although there was some controversy initially, San Francisco demanded more seats on it because of population, and it did succeed in getting that. However, there was objections to it, uh, objections uh, to this bridge, the Sierra Club, and this is in no way denigrating any one of these great groups. The Sierra Club said it would profane the site. The Commonwealth Club said, well, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. Establishment San Francisco uh, the, didn't want it because people in San Francisco rarely want anything at first take to look at and, and develop. Uh, they, the people like Gertrude Athen, the writer, said, oh, not what he... Now, obviously, the Golden Gate uh, Ferry Company with... 50,000 um, uh, people uh, taking the uh, 50,000 trips uh, a day on a, during the workday did not were not for it. Uh, the the War Department, interestingly enough, the War Department was had its requirements that the bridge could not collapse under bombardment and um, and block the harbor for, from other ships coming and going in wartime. But once that was once it settled, decided that that was okay, the War Department and the and the Army wrote the Army engineer. Uh, as expressed in the Army engineer here for San Francisco, came through rather quickly with its approval. So there was 10 years of politics. People say, oh, well, the Golden Gate Bridge was built in slightly more than four years, came in on time, on budget. Here we can't build anything today. That's because the politics were front-loaded. There was a good decade of arguing and wrangling and talking. And, and say, for instance, some 2,000 taxpayers in Mendocino, Napa, Lake, uh, not Lake County, but Mendocino, Napa, 2, 000, some 2,000 taxpayers said, I don't want to join, I, just as an individual rancher, et cetera. Incidentally, the lumber companies, and I, interesting enough, the lumber, big lumber companies in the north were a little hostile to it, too. I think they thought the development would be too much in the north and they'd lose uh, the, all the, 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 the forest land. But the, uh, the, the, so it's a, the Superior Court heard each of those people had the right to come up and be exempted. And exempted for the big payment of the one-time tax to design the bridge. The bridge was, go it was going to be built privately with private bond issues, revenue bonds. Joseph Strauss, who was the promoter of the bridge, went to A.P. Giannini, who had just uh, organized his uh, Bank of America out of the Bank of Italy, <clears throat> and um, Giannini bought the bonds. How long would the bridge last? He asked uh, uh, Strauss. Strauss said forever. Giannini bought the bonds at 3% return when basically he was entitled to 3.2, then they changed it later to 3.2. So there's an example of a bank being nice, being uh, uh, accommodating. Uh, the, the bank, the bank of, of, of what a great visionary he is, was, uh, A.P. Giannini, in terms of constructing California. He also later extended a $79 million line of credit to Henry J. Kaiser to form the Kaiser Permanente Health, Health Program. And uh, so we, we, everything is fine now, but we need a new bridge because that original design was, was not uh, adequate. Stra Strauss is a genius in collecting his team. His team. It includes Leon Mosieff, who had just finished in early 1932, the George Washington Bridge. It included um, Charles Duluth, professor of civil engineering at, um, at uh, Berkeley. It included a, a University of Illinois professor, Charles Alton Ellis, who had also done previous work with Strauss. Alton, and, and it included uh, Oman, Akmar Oman, Oman, who uh, lived on to design a little later the Verrazano Bridge, just, just in, the, in the late 50s, early 60s, from Switzerland. It was like an international team. Uh, Leon Mosieff had come from Lat, had immigrated from Latvia, was of a, a, a Jewish background from Latvia. Oman was a Swiss. Irving Morrow was an old 17th, I mean, um, Charles Alton, the other was from old 17th century Yankee company. De Delerth was a Dutch American. So you had to, this roundup of people. And uh, Strauss was the impresario. He was, the, he was the, the Cecil B. DeMille of the project. It was designed by this team. And that's another thing, too. How many great works of art have this kind of quality of t teamship? I mean, from one point of view, the Golden Gate Bridge looks like a Richard Serra sculpture, another from another, or a Klaus Oldenburg sculpture. From another point of view, it's a very complicated cooperative venture. Irving Morrow, um, uh, Mosieff made the towers light, very light, as high as they could go. You can, those of you who know the George Washington Bridge, you know he went way beyond what he did there in, in, uh, in the early 30s. John Boardman was there, for, part of the team for a while. He was a scenic designer. He gave the towers a kind of tapering quality that, 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 you, that you would have almost with a theatrical proscenium arch. Later, Irving Morrow, the, the Berkeley architect, his wife was a San Francisco-based architect, 
uh, one of the great designers of St. Francis Wood here in the city, Irving Morrow, did the Art Deco decoration. Um, Charles Alton Ellis, with nothing less than a big chief tablet and a number two pencil, did the calculations. So, no, no computers. One, some of the calculations, and again, I'm not a mathematician, but um, it's, this has been described to me, some of the calculations that he did had over 30 variables, and to hold all those variables together in one mind and work it through without the aid of a machine seems to me nothing short of miraculous. In any event, the official report, which you can see in our history room, you can see the math, goes on for page after page. It may, you may not understand it, but I, I don't, but it's certainly beautiful to look at, like almost Egyptian hieroglyphics promising the bridge to come. And then um, uh, Duluth and uh, Almond work on the base, on the suspension system, on the roadway, and the composite design is issued in uh, 31. And it's a re remarkable period from 29 to 31 when this bridge is cooperatively or cooperatively designed. Um, and with the bonds then bought, construction begins under construction boss, supervising construction boss Russ Cohen, whose son Russ Cohen Jr. was for years a very distinguished uh, uh, reporter for the San Francisco Examiner. And of course, you, you know that 75 years uh, just a few weeks ago, May 1937, the, the bridge uh, was opened to, to the public. That pedestrian nature that, that is so powerful on the bridge to this day it, it is, comes out of the, in, in, uh, the expression of the bridge as an expression of the city beautiful. It just takes the pedestrian culture, the promenade culture of the parks, of the city itself, and moves it across that great uh, strait uh, to... Um, to uh, the Marin headlands. Now the technical side of this, the, the, the San Francisco Pier, which involved building that extraordinary uh, uh, fender, emptying that fender out, uh, going down hundreds of feet, determining whether the, the, um, the, the rocks could, sending divers down initially, whether the rocks could hold, and then emptying the water out and still then having a Stanford professor uh, say, no, the rocks, the geological structure won't hold, and a Berkeley professor um, a Berkeley professor saying yes it will and then having to render that debate you'll see that I, I do those who read this book I su suggest all this very briefly to say that it was deja vu all over again people weren't exempt from quarreling in those days or battling out a, 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 a social uh, problem but uh, the, uh, the final touch I think was the color and the decorations. Now that's an Art Deco. Now I'm born in 1940, so I like Art Deco. It's still alive and well. Uh, not that I remember as a kid, although I kind of think of myself, maybe I saw Art Deco as a kid, but I love Rockefeller Center in, in New York. I love the Paramount Theater, Timothy Pfluger's Paramount Theater in, New, in, New, uh, in Oakland, or, or, or any kinds of uh, Art Deco construction. The, the uh, Art Deco here, decoration, not decorations, um, embellishment, uh, if blending into the design, they're, t they're too integral, I think, to call decorations, but to the Art Deco there uh, was put to, uh, there uh, very beautifully uh, by uh, Irving Morrow. Uh, the Roebling Company did the construction of the cables. They, then they did the cables for the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, Bethlehem Steel did the steel. Initially, there was kind of grousing that the San Francisco or California company should do the steel, but then it was pointed out that there was no such thing as the, uh, any factory in any heavy steel mill in California capable of doing that. It's not until 1944 that Henry J. Kaiser gave us our first heavy steel uh, facility at Fontana, California. Uh, but the steel it was all put in place. The working rule for the bridge was that for, or for bridge construction in general was that for every million dollars spent, one uh, life would be lost. That was a calculation, a tragic calculation. One life lost is too many. As the bridge approached almost uh, just towards the last few weeks, two months towards its uh, February, March, April, May, some three months before its, uh, its uh, completion, uh, well, it had one person killed. A young man was killed when a beam came around on a cable, and swung and hit him in the, in the head. Uh, they were pulling off the scaffolding from the under uh, roadside, and the bolts carrying the movable platform broke. Twelve uh, men fell into the, t to the, um, into the net that, um, that Strauss had there, and uh, ten of them were lost. Uh, and that made a total of 11, uh, die, 11 lost their life, which is 11 too many, 
but considering the size and scale, the danger of the bridge was an extraordinary safety record. Strauss himself put out a couple hundred thousand, over a hundred thousand dollars for a great manila of uh, nets to be put beneath the bridge, uh, into which some 22 workers had fallen. And so we would have had to, that would have had to be up to 33 if those 30, because those 22 probably would not have made it. Although there was some suggestion that some of the younger men trying to show their machismo dove into that uh, uh, there, and um, Russ Cohn said he'd fire anybody uh, who dove into it to prove how brave he was. The, um, if you came Monday morning, you looked hung over, uh, you had to drink a quart of sauerkraut juice, which I guess, which Strauss believed was a good hangover cure. Uh, there was also a policy, if you were up in the high steel and you finished the job, don't fake work, don't worry. If you have to sit there for half an hour or two hours for the next real work to come, go do it. Light up a cigarette, or those people smoked in those days, uh, and, um, but don't make work because making work was dangerous and, and uh, will result in accidents. So all these controls worked uh, until that last tragic, uh, tragic day. Well, the, the bridge opens, et cetera, and uh, it's uh, extremely uh, finished except for the, what color to have it. Uh, the armed forces, uh, Ameri the American, uh, what do you call it then, in those days, I think it was part of the Ameri Army Signal Corps, the Army Air Corps, uh, they wanted it, um, I think they wanted it yellow and with black stripes so it could be seen in the fog. The Navy had a similar kind of fog-related, uh, uh, so while they're making this decision, they put on this color, international orange, a, uh, uh, an agent to, to, to a primer to hold it. Now this color, I, as I bring out in my book, this color had made its appearance in 1915 at the Panama Pacific Exposition, where the colorist of the exposition, Jules Guerin, had very importantly picked out colors that could harmonize and yet assert it themselves, but also in a harmonious way with the um, with the with the atmospherics of the of the uh, San Francisco Bay, and this color was one of them. It's not a well-known color, and lo and behold, when the primer was on, everybody said, "That's it, the solution." We sort of stumbled into it. Ben the sculptor Benjamin Buffano, and the San Francisco-based sculptor Benjamin Buffano, the San Francisco-based artist Maynard Dixon, all said, "That's it, that's it." And there was a sort of big campaign. Uh, you didn't have talk radio in those days, but it was that kind of public discussion campaign. People said, "Leave it the way it is," and I think the bridge. The, the color is the final element that just brings the total symphony of creation uh, together. So here we are 75 years later, uh, and of course, uh, tragically as well, some 1,400 suicides later. It's a very de uh, uh, delicate topic. Uh, I chronicle in my book the shift towards uh, suicide prevention. Initially, um, uh, the, the first suicide was very shortly after that. Now, initially, there was a kind of, we can't do anything about it attitude towards suicide, just in the culture in general. On the other hand, when the Colorado Bridge across the Arroyo Seco in Pasadena was suicide central for Southern California, when they put up barriers, the suicide ceased because people couldn't climb up and over. That debate has been going on continuously. And uh, the, as you know, the bridge district has authorized a, uh, a mesh uh, net uh, to uh, and, and is now looking for funding, waiting for funding for that, or whether, whether the, how that's going to work out. Only time will tell. The point was that we had to begin to have a transition, a change, thanks to the suicide prevention activists in our culture, thanks to the rise of mental health, mental hygiene, etc. That um, we had a change towards suicide as something that can, that if prevented, uh, d uh, can be prevented from occurring again. We know from de uh, debriefing four of the people who survived, we know that they uh, ch said they, they have four seconds to go down, that they changed their mind in the millisecond that it was, they were off the, off the bridge. Of course, uh, then it was uh, too late. So th that's a continuing issue. The bridge district is very conscious of that now. The, the uh, bridge general manager told me that uh, last year they prevented in a legal constitutional way by sort of looking at and saying, do you need help, some uh, 100 or so possible suicides. You can't just walk in and, and you can't just walk up to people and say, you, 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 we're going to take you into custody because you look distraught or something. That would mean that they'd have to wind up all of us here in this. In fact, they have to wind up ha wound, uh, round up half of San Francisco. I mean, any good San Franciscan looks at any one time or another. Um, 
in a, tra a transformative state, shall we say, to include myself. I mean that as a compliment <laughs> to my native city. Uh, but anyway, it is, there is a tragic dimension to that. But there's also a triumphal dimension to the bridge as icon for those leaving in World War II. The bridge went into a public eclipse during the Second World War. First of all, traffic, gas rationing, but also for security reasons. The bridge was very rigid on controlling its visual releases of visual culture, et cetera, and the military movements across the bridge. But it served as a powerful icon for the 1.6 uh, million uh, young men and women who left Fort Mason sailed under that bridge for uh, the harm's way in the Pacific, and of course a certain great welcome home when they returned. I think that's one of the reasons why all the wonderful proposals that have been made for a Statue of Liberty kind of structure here in California and the Bay Area have not gone through. The bridge has functioned as that. And besides, Alcatraz is so wildly successful as a um, uh, public destination ever since uh, Clint Eastwood broke out of it in 1962. <laughs> Uh, and for a while there was a kind of snobbery against the Alcatraz uh, popularity by a part of some of San Franciscans, oh it wasn't dignified enough for us, but I don't think we should be telling our fellow Americans what they like or not <laughs> like. Uh, I, th I went to Alcatraz for the first time a couple of years ago, I was absolutely fascinated by it. But in any event, the, uh, uh, the, the, there we have it, uh, uh, this, uh, this total work of art, and I end up uh, my um, discussion of it, uh, sort of still trying to deal with, with, with the enigma of the bridge, uh, uh, the enigma of all art forms. Believe me, uh, as, as someone who spent a lot of time reading and writing and getting a PhD and all that kind of good stuff, etc., you realize that uh, just certain things don't need criticism, don't need analysis. They speak for themselves. But I say still for the time being, and that time being could last for centuries. Incidentally, if you've seen the Star Trek movies, in one of the Star Trek movies, the Starfleet Academy is here in San Francisco, and there's a scene when Captain Kirk there is looking up, not Captain Kirk, Cap is that Captain Kirk? Yes, Captain Kirk is looking up, and there's the bridge. Uh, unfortunately, it has a BART system going beneath it, going over to Marin, but that's 500 years from now, so we don't have to worry. What does the bridge mean finally after each of its engineering and architectural achievements is explored? As in the case of all great art, there remains an element of mystery. Like a Bach fugue or Beethoven's Ninth or a symphony by Mahler, the Golden Gate Bridge can be analyzed in terms of its parts and functions. In its final effect and meaning, however, the bridge is more than the sum total of any of these. The Golden Gate Bridge embodies a beauty at once useful and transcendent. It emanates a music of mathematics and design and offers enduring proof that human beings can alter the planet with reverence, can mend or complete their environment for social purposes without damage to that environment. The bridge is a triumphant structure, a testimony to the creativity of mankind. mankind. At the same time, it also asserts the limits and brevity of human achievement in a cosmos that is as endless and ancient as time itself. When uh, Gordon uh, Kaufman designed the, the great pylons, uh, the great figures rather, the intake valves, or pylon, I, I, my vocabulary, I'm not an engineer, but the intake valves for the Colorado Dam, uh, the Hoover Dam, then the Boulder Dam, now the Hoover Dam, he designed them just magnificently, and of course they put the, put these, uh, the, uh, the an art, uh, artist put these kind of great, almost um, mystical figures standing up over, over, the, uh, over the entrance of the bridge. And when I look at the, uh, the bridge sometimes and I look at the mathematics and I say to myself, uh, guiding myself by the ancient philosopher uh, uh, Pythagoras, who gave us a little bit more than the theorem, gave us the notion that number uh, corresponds to reality. I don't, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a mathematician, but when I see those numbers unfolding across Charles Ellis, the page of the publication in, in 37, 38, and I think of Charles L Alton Ellis doing those those calculations, when I think of the assembly through mathematics and through engineering of all these materials into a structure of this beauty, etc., you also are tempted at least to think of the Golden Gate Bridge almost as an inevitable, almost, an, almost a natural creation. And isn't that really what great works of art do, don't they? They, they speak for themselves. You, you don't really have to run and immediately get a biography of Beethoven when you hear the, the final movement of Beethoven's Ninth uh, and um, 
uh, it's important to note this and that about Da Vinci, but the Mona Lisa speaks for itself. This bridge speaks for itself, and it speaks in a powerful social way, reminding us uh, San Franciscans uh, how privileged we are to live in that city, in that city that uh, John Charles Fremont predicted would one day rise up on these shores. So thank you very much, and I've got a couple minutes for questions, if you'd like any questions. Oh, thank you. Five minutes, please. We do have a couple of minutes for questions. We are videotaping this, and it's going to be on our website at some point. So if you ask a question, I'm going to ask you to talk into the microphone. So anybody have a question? So uh, is this on? OK. We are so lucky to have the, maybe the coolest icon of any city around. But I, w I was just curious, um, you spoke about the, the pedestrian um, walkways on the bridge yeah. and the fact that that in some ways maybe was an extension of the city beautiful uh, yes. promenades and all but was was there any controversy about that i mean I, i'm a little surprised i mean now you look back and you say well you know it's obvious um it's it's a tremendous thing and all those bicycle companies but you know it's not it's obvious that it should have been there it's like the simultaneously with that construction the, the san francisco open bay bridge was being built and on the bottom level, the bottom level was completely rapid transit. So there was no question of uh, pedestrian, uh, there was no question of pedestrian uh, access that way. Uh, and that rapid transit remained, I think, un until really the late 50s, early 60s. Um, the, the, uh, the pedestrian nature of the bridge was, was celebrated right from the beginning. Now, one uh, wishes that, Str that Strauss had designed one uh, wishes that Strauss had designed the, uh, the uh, fences as a little more than slightly about four feet tall. Some people say it because Strauss was only slightly more than five feet tall. <laughs> and that's because of the controversy. But how high would you have they have to be to defer suicides? I don't, I don't know. That's some, I know that when the, when, the, uh, when the barriers were broken, were put up uh, a number of years ago to prevent people throwing things, some people throwing things over onto the, onto the Fort Point, that, that stopped completely. So that question of alteration of the bridge and time goes on, or the sort of continuing development of the, um, of the pedestrian aspect will, will, will give you enough controversy to make up for the lack of controversy at the beginning of the bridge's design. After all, if you're a San Franciscan, if, if a public work is not attached to controversy, it probably doesn't need to be built anyway. <laughs> Sir. Uh, yes, speaking of the pedestrian walkways, I believe on the Brooklyn Bridge, it's raised, it's the highest level that people normally can go, and it's in the middle of the roadway, I believe, so it's, if you, if you jump, you're going to get hit or crushed by traffic. Uh, I've always... I'm wondering, I'm wondering what the symbolism of pedestrian is on the side versus pedestrian in the middle is, and also... Uh, I've always found that the separation from the roadway between the roadway and the walkway is very nervous-makingly small. That's, to me, been the most nerve-wracking part of walking as a pedestrian across the bridge. Yes, and I also feel, again, I'm not, I don't have any background in this, you, you, you kind of look like an engineer. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's a compliment. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I also feel when I drive across that the bike, the bike lane there, I always feel that it's so easy if a bike hits the wrong way and somebody could flip over, etc. But uh, I don't. Th I think that's a, a, a reference to the fact that we just didn't get used, to, we're not used to automobiles there uh, 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 being so big and coming at such speeds in the late 20s, early early 30s. Uh, if you look at San Francisco itself in general, and this is not to make cause and effect, but just to suggest. We live in a city that was, that was laid out in 1847 by Jasper O'Farrell. And some of our streets were engineered later for the automobile, like Van Ness, uh, Geary, um, uh, Alamany, Sierra, a few, uh, Ocean Beach, et cetera. They were modified. Lum even Lombard Street was modified. My father worked on that in the late 30s when it was expanded. But in general, we live in an 1847 grid, which is in effect a 17th century grid. Pre long pre-automobile, and perhaps some of that uh, that sense of constriction, that if it had been if it had been developed in Southern California, 
which grew up with the automobile, in which the automobile was central to the sort of spatialization, the imaginative spatialization of, of, uh, of the culture, it might have turned out differently from how you correctly described it. That's just a guess, though. That's just reading it culturally. I'm not an engineer. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, maybe say, I'll ask you just to say one th other thing. When did San Francisco ever really design adequately for the automobile? Let's take, let's take the, center, the Stockton Garage on Mason Street. It's at Mason and O'Farrell. Remember when it opened up in 1950? Uh, I remember I was a boy of 10 then. Everybody was saying, oh, isn't this great for the automobile, et cetera. Well, it looks today like a very small, constricted space. Uh, the Sutter Stockton Garage is, is holding up pretty, pretty well, I think. Uh, in other words, I think there's a, uh, I think there's a time when uh, there are shifting perceptions of how much space is needed that a culture has, and I just think that we didn't have as, uh, we didn't have it. Uh, the automobile was there, but if it had been more powerfully there, we might have made the bridge a little wider. On the other hand, that means the towers would have been higher. Could they have gone higher? The whole calculus might have been upset. Anyway, it's a good question. I'm not a, Our I'm last not question. It's a provocative question. Hey, yes, sir. Could, could you talk about you know Strauss saving Fort Point by designing the arch? Yeah. Oh, uh, Strauss the arch. Well, he saved Fort Point. Um, Initial plans, they were going to clear uh, Fort Point away and then just put the pier right there. That would have made for a longer pier, of course. But Strauss wanted to protect that, and so what he did was incorporate, uh, his designers did, at his encouragement, he said, no, we're not going to tie, he did a bridge within a bridge, that beautiful arch that soars over Fort Point, not only saves Fort Point, it makes a statement culturally about the arch, which is the fundamental a design of bridges before the invention of the suspension bridge. It's a wonderful thing. I belong to the Dolphin Club, and so I've swum, I don't, swum, swam? What's the past tense? Swam. Swam. So I've swam. Swim, swam? Swim. Swim. I've swimmed. <laughs> I've swum. I, I can't get the past tense. The past tense has failed me. Under the bridge, it's magnificent to look up at those, up at those arches when you come through. If you, if, on a supervised swim. Okay, well, we're going to have to end it there. And I want to thank Dr. Starr for coming tonight. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. Thank you.